Hello there, welcome to Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Today I'm very pleased to be interviewing the Deputy Prime Minister of Bulgaria, the country that's just taken over the rotating presidency of the EU Council for the next six months. Tomislav Donchev, thank you very much for being our guest on Talking Europe. Pleasure is mine. Well, uh, Bulgaria has now been a member of the EU for just over 10 years. Yeah. This is uh, your first time holding the rotating presidency. It's a great challenge for us. Well, a great challenge. And also, I'm interested to know, what are, the, what are the big dossiers you're going to be dealing with and what are your priorities? The number and type of dossiers are well known, but uh, probably will be more interesting to discuss uh, our priorities. And they're connected uh, to the future of Europe, future of the cohesion policy, young, uh, young people. Uh, and, uh, of course, we have to deal with all of the hot dossiers that are in, in our hands, but uh, we will try to focus the attention of other member states to all of these issues mentioned, uh, mentioned by me. OK, um, well, as you say, it's a, it is a big challenge. As the presidency was handed over from Estonia, mm -hmm. Jean-Claude Juncker, the Commission president, said uh, that smaller member states make for the best presidencies. Uh, Estonia, of course, quite a lot smaller than Bulgaria, but compared to Germany, France, Poland, Bulgaria is still relatively small. Relatively. You've, said, you've said yourself in the past, the voice and weight of EU countries is theoretically equal, but it isn't so in practice. Do you feel that Bulgaria is overlooked? Let's hope that the voices of all of the member states uh, are equal and uh, we, uh, we have to do our best to do it. We've also got a, a very particular atmosphere in the European Union at the moment. It's going to go from 28 members of this family to just 27 mm. in just over a year's time when the UK leaves. Uh, now, Brexit is clearly a priority for all parts of the EU throughout this year. Uh, Bulgaria is among the smaller states that receives quite a lot of this funding. You mentioned before the cohesion policy funding. Uh, it's, it's thought that Brexit's going to leave a budget hole in the cohesion policy of perhaps around €9 billion. Euros. Uh, are you worried about the impact that will have on Bulgaria? I think that talking about uh, the Brexit, the budgetary impact of the Brexit is not the most interesting. Of course, there will be, there will be budgetary impact, negative, negative impact to the EU budget because the um, UK is a net donor to the, to, the, to the EU budget. But for me, more important uh, are the political outcomes, uh, also what will be the future relations between the EU and UK and uh, uh, also what type of access to the single market uh, will have our friends uh, mm -hmm. from UK. It's, it's a key. Of course, uh, talking about uh, the budget, uh, there arithmetically there are limited number of options how to, how to solve the situation. Uh, the first option is to spend more, to have a um, smaller size of the budget or to, to spend less uh, or, or to, to pay more. For or a combination, or, or a combination between these two options. And uh, as the president of the EU, so to speak, for the next six months, do you have a preference of those options? Because of course, paying more money into the European Union, it's never a popular choice. But it's there not. are many countries that will be it's losing not. out. Of course, I can accept all type of conversations, uh, how to arrange the budget. But for me, it's more interesting uh, and it's more important the conversation about our goals because uh, I know that it's stupid to spend money without clear package of goals. And I prefer to combine the conversation about the, the future budget, uh, MFF, uh, with the um, more important conversation about our priorities and goals. OK, well, a, a, another big preoccupation for the European Union for several years now has been migration, uh, the huge numbers of people that are coming into the continent. Of course, uh, in terms of your geographical place in Europe, Bulgaria We're has border a... border country. Exactly, a 220-ish kilometre land border with Turkey, where, of course, uh, many hundreds of thousands of uh, Syrian refugees currently are. Uh, recently, uh, this January, your Prime Minister, Mr B Borisov, made a joint call with the Czech Prime Minister for reform to the European asylum system, uh, saying it, it's not fair as things currently stand. This includes rejecting the idea of quotas for how many people mm -hmm. each member state has to take in. Uh, why, why this stance from Bulgaria? Talking about uh, the migration policy, I think that it's, it's a challenge, but in the same time, uh, we have to treat it as a chance because EU has the chance to formulate the new strong policy accepted by all of the member states. Strong policy, investing in stronger union. And um, 
Of course, there are a lot of debates what to do with refugees, what to do with economic migrants, but there are some zones of consensus. Mm. Uh, started uh, with, um, with this, that uh, we have to increase our control on the external borders of the EU. Mm -hmm. And we are ready to share our experience because uh, I pretend uh, that uh, we protect very well the external border of the EU. On the basis, of course, of some support provided by the Union, but also on the basis of full mobilization of, uh, of our services. At the same time, war is still raging on in Syria. There are still plenty of countries where people are being persecuted for their beliefs, uh, political allegiances, all sorts of regions where they might want to come to. Relatively, very wealthy Europe, developed, uh, free Europe uh, to seek asylum. This conversation is too complicated because, uh, mm. frankly speaking, uh, we have to focus also our efforts to the sources of the problems. To think internally is not the best possible way. We have to invest more political and other type of uh, efforts trying to solve the situation there. Also, there are some other options. Why not to think about the refugee camps outside the territory of the EU? Well, those refugee camps have been uh, criticised by rights groups such as Amnesty International. It, uh, I know that Bulgaria course, supported a, the it's EU. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a endless, it's an endless debate, but uh, why not on the basis of uh, our support uh, to be in the position to, re to require better conditions for all of the refugees in these camps. So do you, do you anticipate that there will be a big rethinking of uh, Europe's stance on migration uh, within the next six months, the next 12 months? I think that it's a challenge, uh, and, but in the same time, it's a chance to formulate new, strong EU policy. OK, all right. Well, let's move on to some uh, issues that uh, specifically uh, impact on Bulgaria. We know that uh, the capital, Sofia, uh, is known as the most polluted European Union capital city currently in terms of air pollution. Uh, it has come into the news for uh, Bulgaria again in recent days. Before we discuss that, uh, we've got a report from France 24's Luke Brown uh, that we can show to our viewers about the situation in Sofia. Ivanka is 86 years old. She lives here in Vladaya, a small village five kilometres from the capital. There's no gas central heating here in this village. Instead, she burns wood, which is cheaper, but not good for her health. That's just the way it is. Everyone looks to spend as little as possible to make ends meet and to hold on. We don't have much money. There are multiple causes for Bulgaria's unhealthy air. People burning wood at home, as well as poorly maintained vehicles. Outdated power and heating plants that burn coal are also a problem. Improvements have been made in recent years. The Maritza 3 East plant has undergone 650 million euros worth of renovations. Now its system of scrubbers to filter the flue gases means it easily meets EU emissions targets, even if that means higher production costs. But the problem in Bulgaria is non-compliance. Locals here call this area 15 kilometers away Mordor, because of the obsolete plants belching fumes into the air. Some companies are doing a lot less to abide by the rules, to the frustration of those that do. There are other power plants in the country that don't meet these uh, environmental regulations. They don't comply with the European standards and they don't comply with Bulgaria's own uh, standards. Um, we would like to encourage the government to be brave and to be strong and to do the right thing, right thing for the health of the citizens of the country. And we also would like the, you know, the European Union to uh, hold the government to a little bit more of account. Bulgaria has ratified the COP21 agreement on climate change. So the government has to act to reduce pollution and choose alternatives to coal. Faced with entrenched interests, reaching those targets will require serious political determination. Well, in that report, uh, we just heard that uh, one power station executive saying he, he wants your government to do more, also calling for the EU to pressure your government to do more, uh, as well as citizens, of course, uh, worried about the air quality. Uh, let, me, let me clarify the situation. Yeah. Talking about the air pollution in Sofia, the um, uh, electric power plants are not among the reasons for the air pollution. Because uh, all of them, they have the facilities for the cleaning, uh, for, the, for, the, for the cleaning. The main reasons for the air pollution are the heating of the houses and the transport. Well, indeed, in recent days, your government said it will appeal uh, a decision from the Commission to impose stricter limits on emissions. Uh, why is that? It's a, it's, a, it's a separate issue. Let's start the conversation with uh, your first question, the air pollution in Sofia, because they are not connected. Um, because the Maritza East second power plant is not near to Sofia. 
It's uh, probably 200 kilometers from, kilometers from Sofia. Talking about uh, Sofia, uh, of course, we know how problematic is the situation and uh, the responsible authorities, mainly the municipalities, they are doing their best mm -hmm. to improve the situation. I would like to talk about that wider picture, though, with the, uh, the power stations, not specifically in Sofia, uh, that legal appeal that Bulgaria is launching. Is it a together, battle you together, could expect together to win? With, uh, some, together with some other countries. It's a serious part of our electricity system and without a kind of transition period, I think that uh, the situation can be problematic for us mm -hmm. in terms of energy supply. OK, well, another area where the European Union is putting some pressure on Bulgaria at the moment is about uh, corruption, saying that Bulgaria has failed to jail corrupt senior officials. The judiciary needs an overhaul. It's inefficient. Uh, as we record this interview, the Prime Minister is facing a no-confidence vote uh, in the Parliament. Uh, is, is this now the time that uh, that work is going to be done on corruption? Do you agree with the European Union? I think that it's a, I'll say it's a question of permanent efforts. We cannot solve all of the problems with the corruptions, with the corruption for the limited period, for instance, one year. It's not, it's not serious. Uh, on the basis of my experience, to find against corruption, there are two main issues to say. Strong institutions and full transparency. Following this way, I think that the government uh, doing, uh, we're doing our best. And I hope that uh, very soon there will be a significant result. Of course, uh, my understanding is we, that we have to treat the society, we have to treat the people as a key ally because without their support, we cannot have the real fight against corruption. Because the corruption is a two-way process. Mm -hmm. Some, somebody trying to, to corrupt the representative of the state. And we, we have to intervene in two possible areas. To think about the representatives of the state, to control them, to guarantee full publicity, and at the same time to, to try to change the habits. Mm -hmm. Well, OK, perhaps lots of work to be done on corruption. Uh, a real pressing area for Bulgaria. Uh, it's uh, ambition to join the Eurozone. A lot of work has been done. The Bulgarian economy has uh, significantly uh, gained in health. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker recently said, though, that more progress is needed. Uh, do you agree with him on that? Or do you think Bulgaria should be joining the Eurozone now? As a budget figures, we, we have... Excellent, excellent budget figures. Zero, zero deficit, even, even surplus. Mm -hmm. We have one of the worst debt in the, in the EU. Uh, Bulgarian left is strongly connected to Euro. We, are, we have a currency board. Um, but uh, we have to do more in terms of uh, convergency. I mean, we have excellent figures related to the GDP growth, but uh, we, we want, uh, we want uh, more. And uh, I am... I do not, for, do not forget that talking about uh, the Eurozone, uh, talking about the Schengen, it's, these two processes are not uh, only technical, they are, they are political. Mm. Uh, together with uh, all, all these measures, uh, we have to do our best to collect political support. So you think perhaps the other members of Schengen and the Eurozone aren't quite ready to accept Bulgaria? We have to try to deliver better messages um, outside. OK. Yeah. All right, well, speaking of messaging, this brings us on rather neatly to something not specifically connected to Bulgaria, but we are uh, very close followers of fake news here on France 24. I know it's something that does impact in the Bulgarian media quite a lot. Uh, we, uh, we show a regular piece on fake news. This week, uh, it's about France. Uh, a question of whether the National Front Party of Marine Le Pen used fake news to try and manipulate public opinion in the run-up to the last election. Take a look at this from Frédéric Simon. Did the National Front use fake news as a weapon during the French presidential campaign? This is what the news site BuzzFeed reports in the long investigative article published in mid-January, claiming the campaign team of far-right candidate Marine Le Pen deliberately sought to manipulate public opinion. But what kind of credit can actually be attributed to this investigation? Well, a former National Front campaign director, David Racheline, seems to have spilled the beans against his own will. Right in the middle of the presidential campaign, he circulated a video report on Facebook accusing the public television service of supporting Emmanuel Macron, a report that was eventually exposed as a fabrication. 
Under the fire of critics, David Rachlin eventually admitted on Twitter that the report was a parody that was deliberately misinterpreted by ill-intentioned journalists. However, this turned out to be a shaky line of defense. The Twitter sphere indeed quickly found some old tweets from David Rachlin, who was claiming at the time to be discovering the terrifying truth about the French public television service, demanding the resignation of Delphine Ernaut, a senior executive. Those tweets were widely taken up at the time by National Front supporters on social media, which seems to confirm that fake news were indeed probably part of the party's campaign strategy. In the meantime, the issue has been taken up by President Macron, who wants to legislate in order to possibly prohibit fake news. Well, there we go, some fake news from France. Uh, Mr. Donchev, uh, fake news is a big problem in Bulgaria as well, there, isn't it? There, there, are in, there are a really big problem because it's a, it's a poison pool for public environment because they can generate uh, a lot of um, public emotions that are not related to the, to the reality. Of course, they are political problems, but for me, they're, they're, uh, on the first place, they are a problem for civil society. We have a lot of experts on the national and the EU level, and uh, let's mobilize uh, them to do, to do their best but uh, they can be harm harmful for the democracy. It is indeed a problem that all of Europe's member states are trying to tackle at the moment. Thank you very much for your thoughts on that and on all of these other issues. Uh, Tomislav Donchev, Deputy Prime Minister of Bulgaria. That concludes this week's Talking Europe for now. Do stay tuned, though, after the news part two of the programme.